My name is Sarah Dixon and I am the Adult Programming Manager here at the Advanced Learning Library. We're very excited to partner with our friends over at KMUW for tonight's program about a newish venture from StoryCorps, One Small Step. Now, before we get started, if you've joined several of our library programs, you know we like to go over all of our Zoom features. Uh, for those of you who might need a refresher uh, or who are new to the Zoom platform, if anyone is still out there, um, we are muting your microphones for the duration of the program so that we're always able to hear the speaker. You'll notice that there's a red line through your microphone icon, and that means that your microphone is turned off. Um, we are recording this program. If you do not wish to appear on the recording, you can make sure that your video is turned off. Next to the microphone icon, you'll see a video camera that says start or stop video. And a red line through that icon means that your camera is turned off. Now, if you have a question while we're, we're going through the program, use the chat feature. Um, along the bottom of your screen, you should see a word bubble with the word chat. Clicking this icon will open up that chat box where you can type your questions. Um, we're gonna do a staff facilitated Q&A at the end of the program, but don't wait until the end to type your question. Feel free to put it in there now. You won't disrupt anything and we'll be able to address it when we get to that point. Um, to be view the tonight's program the best way, I recommend that you put it on speaker view. To change your view in the top right corner of your screen, you should have a view icon. If you click that, you can easily find speaker view. Just make sure that's checked. Okay, so uh, that's all the house cleaning we have for right now, but let's get on to tonight's event. One Small Step is a project that invites two people from opposing sides of the political spectrum to have a conversation about any number of things. And in doing so, we see each other as a human, human being with values, um, and usually a lot closer to their own than some of us realize, and not just some caricature of the other side. I'm going to turn things over to Sarah Jane Crespo. She's the Director of Community Engagement at KMUW. KMUW was chosen as one of only six public radio stations in the country to host and facilitate conversations as part of One Small Step in the last year. Sarah Jane, you helped uh, facilitate these conversations, right? That's right. Um, I had the pleasure of facilitating 26 One Small Step conversations last year, and I wish that we could share all of them with you tonight. They were so impactful. We're going to play a longer conversation for you in a few minutes, but first, here is a taste of what One Small Step sounds like. We all, all live in our own little bubble. Uh, so mm -hmm. my little bubble includes people that basically have the same beliefs as I do. Both sides ascribe motives to the others that are negative that are you know it's not it's not black and white nobody's perfect no, none no, of us have no, all the answers well and tyler i'll tell you in all honesty i think we agree more than disagree whatever the label might be mm -hmm. we certainly do there is a human connection here right yeah and and i don't think it's that hard to find if you look no it's not i suppose i am very liberal uh, but I agree with the same things that you said, that I, I see things in the Republican Party that I agree with and I think that are important. You're a person. You're not a Republican. You're not a Democrat. You're a person. There was a really wide variety in the conversation topics discussed in these events. And some of the conversations were more personal, some more political, and some addressed current societal concerns in really honest ways. The conversation we're about to share a portion of features Tracy and Scott, who were strangers prior to this conversation. And in it, they address prejudices and assumptions as well as so many other subjects. There was a lot of conversation about race recently. I think most of us are prejudiced, right? Which means that we prejudge people based on what we see and it's an immediate reaction. It's something that we see somebody, boom, we make a judgment. And then it's, it's our responsibility to handle that judgment appropriately. If I see a black man walk up to me and he's dressed nice and he's like, hey, excuse me, sir, flat tire over here, is there something, you know? Oh, absolutely. 
versus a young black guy walks up to me and his pants are around his ankles. He's like, hey, dog, I'm going to have an initial different reaction to those two different situations. And so it's not racial. Conversely, if the same young black guy walks up to me, he says, excuse me, sir, I'm, I'm in a bad situation, such and such, flat tire, whatever. Then my initial response to what I saw is going to be different than if I heard, hey, dog, you know, what? <laughs> does that make sense? I hate that racism is being used so much right now, because by and large, I don't think most people are racist. I, too, think that we all are prejudiced. Unfortunately, racism is taught. And I know you can see when kids are, you know, naive and two and three, they don't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So they don't even know to be afraid. You know, even if a, a, a guy came up to your great or your grandchild at two or three and his pants are hanging down and he says, hey, dog, that baby still would not know right. to be afraid. Right. So we all been conditioned. That's right. But one thing you said that got my attention, you said dress nice. And I thought, oh, it's the image. And so, it again, is. we are, you know, we're still being manipulated by media and imagery. We just have to work hard, like you said, to identify these prejudices when they surface in our life. And it's our responsibility to respond with the knowledge. And that's the only way we're going to get out of it. Because right. we all been conditioned to it. So I grew up in an all-white community. My brother and I were the only African-Americans or Blacks in our entire school. You can imagine our experience. However, I had a good childhood. I think that we have to work to identify the prejudices that we've been conditioned to operate in, even the racism. I know that African-American men are not the only ones to walk around with their pants hanging below their yes, behind. Right. But you put that on us. And so, you know, there's that imagery again. And I just like, why do you feel like if a African-American calls you your dog, I see them all. I see all of them wearing like that. Right. But why is it that you had to categorize it as an African-American? I think the way that I framed that whole statement was I'm not racist and how I would act in two different situations and how myself or people prejudge people based on what they see immediately. And then, like I said, it just... I agreed exactly with what you just said, like how we handle that prejudgment, you know, what, what we do with that, what goes off in our head is not what has to come out of our mouths. Scott, I want to tell you, thank you for taking the time to take this, you know, to go into this conversation. I just think we need more of these because it's my theory that we will acknowledge that we mostly agree about most things. We want our kids to have good school and education. We want all of our kids to have opportunities to advance themselves. And that's what these kinds of conversations, in my opinion, uh, reveal, that we kind of all want the same things. How we go about doing it might be different, but I think we all want the same thing. So I just want to tell you, thank you. It was my pleasure meeting yeah, you. No, thank you very much for having a conversation with me. And I feel like we could we could talk for another 45 minutes and hopefully uh, somebody can get some value out of our conversation someday. So these conversations are long, 40 minutes typically. Tracy and Scott's was closer to an hour. And you're not always going to necessarily say things in the most politically correct way uh, over that period of time. But when these people are honestly curious about each other, it allows for so much discovery. And these conversations were most impactful when the individuals were understanding of each other's attempts to verbalize exactly what they feel or think. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear that uh, they came to that understanding, even though they may have not found the right words right away. So that's, that's great stuff. Um, so right now we're going to kind of widen our scope. We're going to look at a broader approach with Dr. Timothy Schaefer from the Institute on Civil Discourse and Democracy over at K-State. Um, as an interdisciplinary scholar and practitioner of deliberative democracy, civic education, and group communication, Dr. Schaefer focuses on the advancement of democratic practices by focusing on the role of civic professionals in institutional settings, such as higher education, local government, and non-governmental organizations and relationship with diverse communities. 
Dr. Schaefer currently serves as an, as an associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies and as director of the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy at K-State University. He's also director of civic engagement and deliberative democracy with the National Institute for Civil Discourse at the University of Arizona. He received his PhD from Cornell University. Dr. Schaefer, can you help us better understand why these conversations like One Small Step are so important? Yeah, no, thanks so much uh, to everyone uh, for the invitation to be part of this conversation. And I think the clips just a moment ago really highlight why it's so important for us to be able to talk to one another um, and not simply talk, but really to listen. So I, I have a, a, a number of slides I was gonna show tonight just to kind of, I think as uh, Sarah was mentioning just a moment ago, kind of broaden some of the perspective as we think about some of this, because we can, we can um, kind of hyper-focus in some ways, uh, two discrete individuals, uh, but we can also think about this as part of kind of a larger uh, kind of scheme or a situation that we find ourselves in right now. So. So what I'd like to do is, is walk through, um, uh, and I'll explain in just a moment, these kind of four pieces that I think really help us get to one of the themes that I heard um, earlier and in the preparation for tonight, really thinking about this idea of finding people's humanity, right? And these are small incremental things that we can, and I would argue that we should do. So let me just say a little bit, I teach and research and write about things like dialogue and deliberation really in these kind of learning environments. And I'm really interested in the possibility of what comes from these kinds of conversations. So what is possible when we can communicate well with one another? And so tonight, uh, just as a, as a brief bit here, I have these four points I kind of want to walk through. One is the state of kind of civil discourse in the United States, kind of how and why we're divided. We, we heard some of that just a moment ago. And also why discussion matters and recognizing the importance of this idea of listening deeply. And then finally, if we're not trying to all agree or have consensus, then what? So, so let me step here first into this idea of kind of the state of civil discourse. In 2017, the American Psychological Association had a study and what they found across generations, and you can see it here, that um, a majority of, of Americans, again, from millennials to, uh, to senior citizens, find that this is the lowest point in our country's history that they can remember. And again, this is from 2017, so we could think about that kind of today. And so these are folks who have lived through things like World War II and the Oklahoma City bombing, September 11th. And so it matters less whether or not that's true, quote unquote, and more the fact that people feel this way. So we're in a challenging moment as, as a country. On top of that, a little bit more focused for the, the topic tonight is this idea of civility. Uh, there's an annual survey that comes out, and you can see this from 2018. I show it for kind of the graphical reasons. If you look on the left side of this uh, graphic, you can see 95% of people agree that this country has a civility problem, right? For both Republicans and Democrats, actually, the percentage is just a little bit higher at 95%. We are in a, in a moment where this idea of people talking with one another in ways that are, quote, civil, um, is, is recognized as a real challenge. And this is not simply from 2018, but we can largely look at this for the last decade. Um, from 2010 to more recently, you can see very steady uh, kind of percentages, right? 65% to 69% who say civility, the lack of thereof is a major problem. And then, you know, as you can see, the percentages 24 to about 30% say this is a minor problem. So that's where we get that really stable number. So this really speaks across the board uh, for party affiliation and the like. So what do we actually mean by civility, right? So this is something you might hear and think about a lot in this idea of people talking to each other. Well, we can think about civility as politeness. You know, it's the following the rules, it's the kind of code of conduct, it's the thing that frankly makes this event work right now. I'm the only one speaking and you're all listening, so thank you very much. But this idea of allowing us to have this exchange, there's a, super, a certain superficiality in some ways that comes with some of that, and that's why, uh, understandably, a lot of people want to challenge that. But as you can see, this kind of second point here, this idea of civility as responsiveness, really is this idea of, of having some expectation almost like a duty of civility, right? To be able to explain to one another why we have the, the views and the positions that we have and why it's so important for us to actually be able to engage around that in some kind of fair-minded way. As that third bullet, bullet point here highlights, right? If the slogan for civility is politeness is that we can, we can disagree without being disagreeable. Here in Kansas, right, we say the kind of Kansas nice. 
Uh, the slogan for the civility as responsiveness might really be much more this idea of disagreements, no reason for us to stop talking with one another. So these conversations uh, that you, you, um, you will, will listen to and hear through this program, the one, one small step really highlight, I think, this idea of, of listening to understand and civility is being really attentive to what's going on around us. So how and why are we divided? Well, I have a, uh, an image that I wanna show in just a moment from Twitter and, I'll, and I'll, I'll show it and then I'll kind of say a little bit about it in just a second. In so many ways, we exist right now in a time where we have easy platforms. We can be oppositional to one another as these dogs, right? They bark when the chain go, when the fence goes up, right? Because there's something that's dividing them. And we can think about kind of online communication right now falling into that. But we can also really think about what happens when we kind of remove some of these barriers, some of those caricatures, as was mentioned earlier, and we're able to see one another in, um, in a more kind of authentic light. Well, one of the other layers that comes to this is actually a graphic that I'm gonna kind of talk over here as well is that I'm gonna show you kind of the, the movement from the US Congress from the middle of the 20th century to, to just a few years ago. And what you'll find is you'll see these larger dots mean they have bigger connections and the thicker lines between them kind of mean kind of stronger, thicker connections. And so understandably, you can see here in the middle of the 20th century in a lot of ways, uh, we have some easy divisions, but we also have people who kind of cross the aisle, so to speak, right? We have liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. And in many ways, uh, especially if you're a little bit older, you might recognize and be able to think about a lot of people who fall into that. But what you start to see right about now, actually, and it starts to kind of get more intense here in uh, the last 20 years or so, is that we have fewer and fewer people who kind of cross those ways, right? So there's those few outliers. This is why everybody talks about Joe Manchin right now, for example, because he's one of the few people who would kind of exist there in the middle. So if we look at this over this kind of course of time, really since the middle of the 20th century uh, to, to relatively recently, we can see this kind of uh, division happening at, at, at the congressional level. Well, but it's not only happening there. We can think about this in kind of a local way. Bill Bishop uh, famously wrote a book a number of years ago called The Big Sort. And the subtitle, as you can see it here, is why this kind of clustering of people who are like-minded is kind of tearing us apart. I wanna show you two images here in just a moment. It's kind of like going to the optometrist. So here's the first one. This is from 1976. This is what before Bishop talks about as the sort, right? So this is politics before the sort. It matters less which party um, but what you'll recognize is the white counties here are competitive counties, which means the margin is less than 20 percentage points. And if you follow politics, 20 percentage points is a really significant, significant difference uh, between a winner and a loser. And I'm going to show you 2004. So again, it doesn't really matter which party, but just the fact that we lose a lot of those kind of competitive places. So here comes the optometry bit, right? Here's the first one. Here's the second one. And so as we look at these, we, we start to recognize that we do have this kind of clustering effect happening across the country. And even more recently, um, just, uh, uh, just very recently, in fact, there was a study that came out that looked at 180 million voters, just about every voter, pinpointing them down to who, you know, who they are, where they are, these kinds of things, their affiliation and the like. And what the, the research found was, and I'm gonna show you another graphic here, is you can start to see the party affiliation um, but if you look at the bottom one is the really fascinating one, right? This kind of color scheme from the yellow to the more red and that sense of exposure and exposure being exposure to someone with a different uh, party affiliation and kind of views of the world. And so what happens is we increasingly don't have these opportunities because of where we choose to live, um, where we maybe choose to congregate, for example, in faith communities and the like. And we don't have this level of exposure that that in the past might have existed a little bit more significantly, but because of, uh, frankly, mobility, um, some people can move and others who, who can't um, kind of get left, right? And so when we talk about white flight, for example, comes into play. The conversation that we were listening to earlier kind of highlights just a little bit of this. This sentiment get cap gets captured in a lot of work. A very famous book, you might have heard this title before, and you can actually pick it up in probably just about every library that's, that's out there. Robert Putnam famously wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And what he found was, um, and, and we could think about this, think for yourself, have you ever bowled in your life? Who did you bowl with? 
in the past, and especially kind of this, at this high point of the middle of the 20th century, when we had this really kind of thick community life, people were bowling in leagues, right? So they were showing up with coworkers um, who, who were coming from different places, different neighborhoods, backgrounds, uh, faith traditions and the like, and over maybe a pitcher of beer and some bowling, they were talking, frankly, about life, right? What was going on in their families? What were maybe some of the challenges they were facing? But the sense of bowling alone, what happens is, and he tracks this along with a number of other things, is that people still bowl, but they don't bowl in those ways. They're not parts of the Tuesday night league, for example. If they're choosing to bowl, it's with immediate family and friends. So we don't have the same kind of experience with people who are different from us. More recently, uh, Mark Dunkelman and Timothy Carney, both actually from the ideological left and from the ideological right, write in similar ways to Putnam and basically reinforce a lot of these findings. The, the Vanishing Neighbor, uh, really looking at this uh, intense, you know, th thinking about these three cir concentric circles. The center circle is our immediate family and friends. The outer circle are those kind of special interest things. You know, think about every email list that you're on or the mailers that you receive um, asking for donations. That's your outer circle and that's really strong. Or if you're a gamer, for example, you can be connected with people all over the world. It's that middle circle of the kind of geographic community that's really kind of getting lost, right? And you might even think about for yourself, do you know the people who geographically live in your neighborhood, for example? Can you name them? For me, I can name many of them, but I can sure name everybody that I grew up with in my neighborhood as a child. And in many ways, a lot of us are able to do that. Because of mobility, we lose an essence of that. And what are some implications? Carney bu Carney's book does something somewhat similar um, really looking at, at this through the lens of why do some communities, especially smaller rural communities, do well, right? And why do others kind of fall apart? And what he finds is that these strong kind of connections, opportunities for people to have shared life with one another allows communities to, to succeed, especially when it seems like they might not. So this brings me to kind of the third point I want to mention here. Why discussion matters? And frankly, recognizing the importance of listening deeply. I'm showing you a, a, an excerpt from a book by uh, Harold Saunders, um, who did a lot of work internationally. He, he uh, unfortunately passed away just a few years ago, and I had the opportunity to know him through some of the work that I do. He worked in a, a number of kind of conflict zones, so he was instrumental uh, playing uh, a role in the federal government, for example, in the Middle East, some of the peace process communication um, that's, that's happened over the last number of decades, and in other parts of the world where there were some serious kind of racial and ethnic conflicts that were shaping not just regions, but entire countries. And I highlight a section of his book here. And I just wanna take a moment with this because I think in so many ways it speaks to when we think about this idea of people talking to each other, what are we trying to do? And he says this here, and this is the highlighted piece. Dialogue is a process of genuine interaction through which human beings listen to each other deeply enough to be changed by what they learn. Each makes a serious effort to take others' concerns into her or his own picture, even when disagreement persists. No participant gives up her or his identity, but each recognizes enough of the other's valid human claims that he or she will act differently toward the other. I think this is just one of those beautiful kind of statements about what's possible. And when I think about this idea of the one small step, this intentionality to open oneself up, as, as Saunders says, to listen deeply enough to be changed by what they, what they learn. Not necessarily that they do, but they might. That's only possible if we listen deeply. And we really step into this idea of, of engaging in dialogue with others, especially those that we have some real conflict with, that we have, and we could think about all sorts of things in the United States right now that would be really good examples of that dividing line, whether it's about race, whether it's about class, whether it's about kind of party affiliation politics. And the reason why this becomes so important, and I'm gonna show an image that I, um, I came across not long ago on social media somewhere, I think that really highlights why this becomes so important. Because if we have this idea of engaging in dialogue and being able to listen to one another deeply, that we can really come to understand, not necessarily agree with, in many ways, 
we may not ever, but we can at least move towards understanding. It allows us to unpack our, our, complex, our complexity as human beings, right? Having better ways of speaking and listening with others allows us to acknowledge and engage one another as complex people. I share this not necessarily because it's me, but may maybe it'd be pretty easy that way, right? That we have competing interests and challenges that we wanna face and address. What makes that possible for you to know about that is for you to ask me and for me, me to feel comfortable enough to share that with you. So this idea of recognizing kind of our complex existence becomes possible because we listen to one another. What are some practical steps that help make that possible? Well, here are four that come from the National Institute for Civil Discourse. There are lots of lists. Our Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy here at K-State has some ground rules that we love to use. Um, and you can find those rather easily, but this is a little bit um, uh, more on the brief side and I think kind of gets to the essence of what I want, what point I want to make here, right? That four practices we might want to think about. One, don't interrupt, right? Give the chance for the other person, if we're thinking about this kind of in a dialogue, uh, for them to actually say what they want to say, right? Conversation requires you to allow others to actually express their positions and views. Don't cut them off. Don't, um, don't make all these assumptions. Allow them to speak even if it's challenging and maybe uncomfortable, as we heard even a little bit of that clip just a bit ago. Second, don't resort to name calling, right? Stick to actually what's being said. Let's talk about this through this lens of kind of the exchange of ideas. If we do that rather than this kind of caricaturization of somebody and, and putting them, slotting them into certain categories because of maybe how they identify, whatever that means, um, we, we can do something different, right? So this idea of not kind of falling to this kind of low level of communication is really important. And name calling and whatever that means uh, to you is I think this really kind of minimal way of engaging. How do we raise, how do we elevate the conversation? What makes that possible is this idea of listening for understanding. Really try to hear what's going on. And this is different as was mentioned a moment ago by Saunders, this is different from agreeing. You know, get to the point where you understand where they're coming from and why, what motivates them? What are the things that they care about? Even as we heard, right, care, concern about children and family and education, you're gonna find very few people who don't ha have those kinds of values, but getting to that and understanding what, uh, what that means and where that goes is really important. So this idea of listening to understand is really essential. And then finally, it's not always gonna work out, right? Um, you might want it to, you might really want it to, but be willing to kind of move on. Not everybody is going to be kind of reasonable, right? You have to have some parameters and boundaries. If someone is going to say you shouldn't exist as a person, that conversation is not going to go very well. So you need to kind of get out of that scenario, um, agree, right? And, uh, dis you know, agree to disagree and kind of walk away. Um, and if you've kind of kept this civil in those ways, you might be able to come back. But if we kind of burn the bridge, so to speak, if we resort to this kind of simple kind of slinging of attacks and name calling, then we've, we've kind of lost the opportunity for that future opportunity, that possibility to actually listen and learn from one another. And then finally, and very much related to this, and so this is really brief, if not consensus, then, then what? Well, listening deeply really allows us to learn from others, right? And to recognize their humanity. Here comes the other H word, humility. Humility allows us to acknowledge that how we see the world, how I see the world, is not the only way to see the world. So better understanding the values behind positions and, and kind of decoupling those in a significant way allows us to find commonality. And in many instances, we don't necessarily need or even want to reach consensus. We need to understand what motivates people. And then finally, knowing what's behind a position allows us to find common ground, or frankly, if nothing else, at least be aware of what someone else thinks. And to kind of conclude here, another um, wonderful image that I've, I've come across not too long ago captures, I think, the spirit of some of this. If we can engage one another with a, a level of humility, if we listen to understand and to learn, and it's um, engaged in such a way that we al allow ourselves to have civil discourse, we might be changed, as Hal Saunders says, we might be changed by what we learn. We don't necessarily have to abandon, nor should we, frankly, in many situations, the views that we have, but understanding others and what motivates them 
and what drives them to the positions that they have really afford the opportunity that we might learn, listen, and grow. And as is highlighted here, a lot of this is framed in this language of language and information. There's nothing worse, I think, than that language uh, that we, we heard a number of years ago um, when one of the presidential candidates, John Kerry, got kind of flagged as a flip-flopper. I don't think it's bad to be a flip-flopper if what's making you change your position is in fact new information. And it could be factual information, but it could also be through lived knowledge and experience. So uh, allowing yourself to be open, as Saunders says, to be open enough and, and to listen deeply enough to possibly be changed is such a significant thing that we all should do. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of the, the wonderful event tonight. I'm so excited. I've been following this work for a long time and really appreciate the chance to, to be here and have some conversation a little bit later. Thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. That was awesome. And it's great to think about this, this project from a broader perspective. Um, I did catch up with Tracy and Scott this week to talk about their experience um, and they even shared a second one small step conversation because they both felt like the experience was so worthwhile. So they've each thought more about their conversation in the weeks and months following it. They both put thought into what they said or meant to say. Scott even re-listened to their first conversation in its entirety before we met up again. And he said he was hesitant to have that first conversation. Um, and the first thing I asked him in our little reunion was what made him change his mind about taking one small step. And here's what he said. Oh, I, I guess like everything in life, like you don't want to just jump on a roller coaster. Uh, you look at it and then you, you realize everybody that just got off of it uh survived and so <laughs> let's go and and so just kind of that mentality where you look at things and go what's the worst that can happen and uh you just pull the trigger and do it yeah 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 so was it what you guys expected it to be i'm um, i'm i'll say i was very happy with the way that it turned out yeah i was very pleased with the way it turned out it just it built and it supported my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> so it did support your thesis, you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you think that the and your thesis was more in common than than we than divides us? You said. Um, what do you think you kind of came away with the most, Tracy, that you and Scott have in common? You know, I really enjoyed my conversation with Scott, and I. I really didn't find the differences. You know, like I say, uh, how we go about addressing some of our concerns may be different, but I think we still have the same kinds of concerns. And I just really didn't find much differences. We have a lot in common with his family structure and uh, even politically somewhat, but um, I didn't find that much different, to be honest with you, that I came away with it. And I know this is one of the questions and I'm just going to kind of run it. Well, no, I'm let Scott answer his part first. Do you have anything to add? Oh, go ahead, Scott. Well, yeah, I think largely um, we do have so much in common. And I think if you really, if you step back and look at it, um, you'll find that most I, I would say Tracy and I are just your run of the mill, normal, average people, right? Like neither one of us are, you know, I don't know. I, we're just pretty standard people uh, in, in the Wichita area. And so um, uh, we're all going to differ a little bit, but I feel like kind of what Tracy was saying uh, in the beginning that the, the media is kind of portraying this side and that side and trying to create this uh division and and not even so much the media but a lot of our our government officials are um so so much you know towing the line this way or that way and that that creates it and then it's amplified by the media and that's kind of how i feel but but knowing that this is really truly how it is that 
we may have some minor, I don't even know, dif disagreements, but differences of opinion on, on things. Uh, but largely, we all want the same thing. And that's for everybody to have the opportunity to be successful and to, to live their lives how they, they see fit. Is there something that you guys think that you learned from the conversation, either about yourself or or something else? Or your takeaway? I definitely, I did. And I said before, um, I really did not know or, or yeah, know that there, the conservatism and, and, and I'm not saying, but this is what happened in the first call associated with I just never can associated it with the Constitution and so it made me think really more about um, and I I don't profess to know what the Constitution says you know we throw that word out with you know well that's what does the Constitution say well I don't really know what the Constitution says and so it made me like think well maybe I need to go and read the Constitution. Uh, of course, it's in old old English language and all, but maybe you know we do need to bring civics back into the school room to so that we will actually know what we're voting, what these politicians can and cannot do. And I feel like the lack of that has released so many of our what they say they can do, and you know what can they really do, and what can we hold them to? And so I had I realized I don't really know what the Constitution says. Yeah, maybe bringing civics back to the campaign trails <laughs> mm -hmm. would be helpful. <laughs> yes, you know, they just a lot of talk and we like it and some don't like it and then they, but can they really do this? Should they really be doing this? And then again, you know, there's another side of it that says, well, the constitution was written by men, so that means it's fallible. So there's all <laughs> kinds of, you know, uh, arguments on both sides. <laughs> Scott, how about you? What do you think you kind of learned either about yourself or or what your kind of takeaway was from the, the from the experience? Well, I think uh, takeaway uh, was was really just that we're I guess more than anything that Tracy's uh, thesis was right. We're <laughs> we're all. Uh, we're all out here doing our own thing and, and we're mostly closer together than we are apart in our beliefs. Um, and I think we should be able to people. Okay. Uh, grandpa. I think I talked about grandpa quite a bit. He said, you don't talk about politics. You don't talk about religion. It's two things you don't yeah. talk about. Mm -hmm. And, and it shouldn't be that way. You know, I mean, if you're if you're uh, a true Christian and we talked about that in the, in the first one, uh, I don't run around saying that about myself, but you will share your faith with other people and try to bring them in. And uh, and then as far as politics goes, um, you know, we should not be afraid to be able to have a conversation and disagree and still be friends and walk away. Uh, and I think that this proves that that can be done. Now, Tracy might punch me if she was actually in front of me, but I doubt that. So <laughs> uh, I think that's that's just how we, um, I think Tracy was right. I think we have more in common than uh, we think at large. If that mm. makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my uh, willingness to have this conversation is really because uh of my desire to kind of bring down the fire uh that is brewing you know uh in our communities and i say communities in a very loose way but this fire that is and, and i think january 6th is a prime example of how when people live in these silos and they only receive their information from a particular source and they're not open to new, uh, no kinds of uh, new information or new perspectives. And then this thing just blows up on us. Whether you were for it or not, it was out of control behavior. And it was an assault on our US Capitol and really on our government. But that is that fire that is, my desire to have this conversation is not necessarily just to prove myself right. It's for us to come, you know, we gotta come back to a place because 
If not, it's just going to get worse. And so we're not going to even be able to live. Um, you know, that was, I'm from the Washington, D.C. area, so but that was on Capitol Hill. But then it's going to flow down to Main Street and West Street. And you know, so don't have these kind of conversations. This is going to get worse. It's never going to get better. So do you, have you both told like friends and family about the conversation that you had? I what have. Did you, what did you say, Tracy, about it? Um, I was proud of it. And I was proud that Scott and I were able to have a civil uh, discourse. And it wasn't, and like he said, you know, it wasn't uh, him trying to, to um, you know, discredit me and me trying to discredit him. It was more us trying to just come together and have a conversation where we might disagree on about how we uh, solve whatever those problems are. So I was proud of it. I was proud that we ended together. I feel like if I ever saw him in public, I would be able to say, you know, hey, Scott, it's me, Tracy, you know, the one that, that's what I want, you know. And so I was really proud of it, that it ended well. Mm -hmm. You know, like Scott said, he thought he was going to be with somebody and it was going to be. A, I was just really happy with the way it ended and the, and the way it happened. It wasn't contentious and it wasn't it didn't have a lot of bitterness in it. I feel like the spirit of it was truly honest and, and with integrity. So I was really proud of it. I've told so many people and then and then, uh, you know, it's going to be in the Library of Congress. And so if I die today, you know, it's in the Library of Congress. And so I've told my kids that. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Scott? Uh, I'm scared to death that my parents are going to listen to it. <laughs> 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 but no, I'm 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 happy with it. I'm glad that we did it, and uh, I look forward to to have an opportunity to do it again. Well, in my world, um, we always have to be uh, the good folks that are in my space have to be good listeners, and so this is kind of like practice, always practice, to, so you can really hear what people saying. Sometimes what people are saying is not what they are trying to communicate. And so it has helped me. And this is all the kind of practice to just be a good listener so that you can really help. You can't help people if you don't really know what the problem is. And this is practice to be a good listener. Well, thank you both so much for taking one small step to begin with and for revisiting the conversation with me now. I really appreciate your time. Are there any uh, last thoughts that either of you would like to give? Well, if this is used as a promo of some sort to, <laughs> you know, encourage other people, I would just say, you know, like Scott said, just jump on it and do it. I guess if you're, if you're listening to this and you feel like you're a little bit more conservative uh, and you're afraid to have the conversation, don't be, I don't know. I guess don't, at the end of the day, don't be afraid to have a conversation with somebody um, and know that uh, if you're wrong, if we're wrong about whatever it is, we can always learn from that. Uh, even if we're, if either way, if we're right or we're wrong, we can we can learn from these conversations. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you both so much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. And this is pretty representative of what occurred in a lot of these conversations. The individuals felt at the end like they really did have something or a lot in common. So the mission of One Small Step has been to humanize the other side by bringing two strangers together to talk about themselves and their values. And although some conversations didn't even include a mention of politics, they really were impactful. People don't have to change their minds in order to come together, but they do need to display a level of compassion for one another. And it's easy to do that when we get to know each other as people. It does take some bravery to kind of get on that roller coaster though. I really, really uh, enjoyed listening to Tracy and Scott. That was really, uh, powerful stuff. Um, so now we're going to go and hear from Melissa Velasquez. She is a field manager with StoryCorps who is producing and piloting this whole project of One Small Step. 
And Melissa got to tour around the country as part of the StoryCorps mobile tour. So um, I'm sure that was a really fun time. Melissa, can you tell us, uh, and those watching, um, how they can get involved if they'd like to have a conversation of their own? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I first want to just kind of kick it off by just saying, Timothy, what an incredible presentation. And I, I just want to quickly thank, thank you all, the library, for setting this event up and KMUW for just another great local one small step piece and their support and help through the past year in introducing this project to the community. Um, yeah, and like Sarah said, my name is Melissa and I'm the field manager for StoryCorps One Small Step Initiative in Wichita. So I'm here to provide you with a few action items and also at the same maybe uh, take some time to walk you through what participating looks like. So yes, uh, the first call to action is if this presentation resonated with you in any way, sign up to participate. You could head over to takeonesmallstep.org slash Wichita. When you get to that page, you'll see a, um, a box where you could input your email address. We will send you a uh, screening questionnaire. That questionnaire takes about seven minutes or less through that questionnaire, we get a general idea of where folks land politically and also what their interests and, and their hobbies are. So it's pretty easy. The hardest part is, uh, is a brief, there's a brief introduction we ask from people to type up because we, um, we have to, because folks have to think about the way that they want to describe themselves to a stranger. So it, some people get a little antsy about it but it's important. It's an important part of the interview as well because we use it. So uh, folks actually read each other's bios out loud so that they're doing this action of walking in another person's shoes for just a moment. And hopefully that action sparks some questions. So um, like I was mentioning, we use that data along with uh, general demographic information to pair people that may be on the surface seem different but we see something that may connect them, which is why at the end of many one small step conversations, people kind of come out of it, like looking at the person they spoke to and are like, hey, we're, we're not that different. Like I, I could be friends with you. And that's a good thing. That's, that's really the point. So, um, so yeah, once you sign up and, and schedule a time slot, you'll hear from us. We'll provide you with some information and that includes our ground rules, which is very similar to what Timothy referred to as, um, I wrote it down, the four practices to keeping it civil. So our ground rules are very similar to that. Uh, you'll also receive a roadmap to the conversation to just kind of help you prep for that conversation. And the day of that interview, there will be a facilitator in the virtual room, because yes, these conversations are taking place virtually right now. And that facilitator will walk you through the interview process. Um, the recording is about 40 to 50 minutes long. And at the end of the interview, uh, participants get to decide what sort of release they feel comfortable with signing off. So you may or may not decide to archive your conversation at the Library of Congress. But if you are sitting here and saying, Melissa, I have signed up, or I know someone that has signed up and are waiting to participate, we're waiting. Uh, to that I say first, Thank you very much for participating or signing up. Uh, we hear you and we see you. When it comes to scheduling, we have reserved about five days at the end of each month to record these conversations. Um, this is across our four anchoring cities, which Wichita is one of them, and uh, a national list of signups. So every month, our team invites and schedules folks uh, that have signed up to participate. So we've seen a really high demand and it's taking a little longer to work through the list, but uh, we will be recording all year round and we will make sure that everyone that wants to participate gets that opportunity to do so. So we just ask for, for a little bit of patience as we match participants thoughtfully and, uh, and conduct interviews. But um, the, the, this actually leads me to, uh, to my last call to action so we truly believe that, that these conversations are, are worth having now and long after our work in Wichita has ended. Uh, so with that in mind, we created a guide to having these conversations all on your own. 
uh, completely self-guided, maybe with someone from your, from your family, a friend. Um, if you want to think big, maybe within your own congregation, who knows? We, uh, we're hosting a series of webinars to walk people through how to use our virtual recording platform, which, which looks a lot like this Zoom chat. Uh, it's called StoryCorps Connect and um, the One Small Step DIY Guide. And um, that way you could have your own One Small Step conversation. And um, you don't have to wait to be matched with a stranger. You can, you can use our DIY guide and have a conversation with someone you know in the meantime. So I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna add to the chat the uh, webinar registration so that in case anybody is interested in, in learning about that and signing up, please do so. Uh, additionally, I'm gonna add my email address so that if anyone has some questions that you wanna run by me down the road, you're more than welcome to. And, and also if, um, if uh, you're interested in a more hands-on project, um, maybe if you're a school, congregation, a civic network, please reach out and, and we could chat about how we could work together. Again, that webinar is April 19th. And if you do want to sign up to participate, and I hope you do, or share that opportunity with a friend, um, you could go to take one small step uh, org slash Wichita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh... Now you just said that the webinar is on April 19th, but we are on, is that May 19th? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. You're right on, spot on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Well, we have covered a lot of ground in tonight's program. Um, and so what we're gonna do now is start taking some questions. So I did see a comment before um, about civility in Kansas. Nice, um, was the way in Kansas until the mid sixties. Um, I'm trying to just like, Civility prevented authentic listening to the experiences of black Kansans and hearing their voices. It's a conundrum with real parallels to today. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And um, just, I answered in the chat, but there was a question about seeing a place to sign up for Wichita on the One Small Step site. And I believe that that site is specific to Wichita, so you wouldn't necessarily need to specify Wichita. Um, so I wrote down some questions while we wait for additional questions to come in. Um, hopefully you all have some good questions for our presenters today. But um, let me just see here, where do I wanna start? I was wondering, okay, so um, for Dr. Schaefer, your image with all of the dots where we show the connection. Yes, yeah. yes it was so cool. But I'm wondering um, if you have any insight on, well, first, my first question was going to be like, where is social media playing into these, you know, uh, ways of reinforcing ourselves? But then I was trying to think more positively. And so I'm wondering if we frame it as um, what steps can we take to broaden our exposure, right? I mean, obviously, one small step is a great opportunity to do that. But do you have any other advice for those of watching? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, um, and it's also some of the familiar language and things we talk about. You know, kind of being siloed, we're kind of enclaves, bubbles. You know, choose your choose your appropriate image that has you over here and the whoever else over there. Um, there's actually some, and I talk about this in this way in many ways um, and many times. But there's also some fascinating research that says we're not quite as closed off as we kind of like to talk about it, um, but there are some realities that come into play. And, and one very practical thing is. You know, where, where do you access information? Um, how do you come to know what's going on around you? And this is where things like the media and the references that were that came up in the clips that we listened to, and even now, right, highlight the, the fact that uh, depending on where we uh, kind of hear the news of the day, for example, I love NPR, by the way, I'm waiting for my mug for my local station here. Um, um, but this whole sense of, of, of having as broad of a perspective as possible is really important. Uh, so there are some intentional resources and I, I might throw it into the, uh, the box here or somebody um, might do it as well. There's something called All Sides uh, that provides kind of this 
aggregate form of, of information, uh, kind of the headlines of the day, and, 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 and in a filtered way, allow you to see the kind of headline from left, right, and center, right? And in a lot of ways, in certain circumstances, they'll be pretty uniform, but you can also see where they dis are distinct from one another. And so these so, some of these kind of practices, um, really asking of like, where do you come to know information? Increasingly, the percentages are amazingly high, strangely enough, from social media to where we get kind of our news. And being able to step a little bit away from that, um, and, and I know it might seem old school, but like if you're using a computer to literally go to a website and read things rather than wait for kind of the Facebook algorithm to tell you what to look at is, is a kind of, I, I know, I know it's kind of radical, but it is this, this kind of intentional act that you can take that um, a few years ago, there was this great report uh, called Truth Decay, um, actually deeply depressing, um, but it highlighted why we're in this interesting moment, and we've got this kind of confluent, uh, this kind of convergence of, of where we get information, how we actually communicate to, to one another, and all this stuff, and we're in a somewhat unique moment, especially on top of that, this whole question of like, what is true or not, right? So it's not simply having disagreements about policies, but really a fundamental, it's, I'm going to use an academic word here for a moment, it's about epistemology, it's like, how do we know things? Um, and that's, that's a real challenge. What allows us, and, and I think you know, the, the event tonight highlights this, is if we can start to talk with one another, it, it helps us kind of crack a, a, a little bit of this kind of the facade, frankly, that has us couched in these ways. Um, a lot of research right now highlights that people primarily identify with party affiliation kind of identification more than anything else. Well, what happens with that? All of a sudden now I've said, oh, you're a Republican. Oh, you're a Democrat. And I've got this whole set of assumptions that may, may be true, but I don't know until I actually talk to you, right? And so recognizing this, this greater complexity, I think is a really important piece. And if it's okay, just to add to, I think to, to Gretchen's question earlier um, about the kind of civility piece, there was another layer, I chose not to show it, but um, it happens to be here on the shelf. Um, a, a, a book called Beyond Civility. And instead of talking about, I'll just hold it here while I talk for a second. Um, instead of these, these two categories, they talk about weak civility, strong civility, right? So those are comparable to those two categories I was talking about earlier. But what they talk about as being much more kind of prevalent is pseudo civility, right? It kind of looks like civility, but it's not really. And so it's this whole sense of of kind of asking, and this is where it gets kind of racialized in some significant ways, right? We can say, you know, death to those people, right? You know, this kind of power, white power, for example. And if you call that out as saying, that's hateful rhetoric, like you can't say that, like you don't get to, you don't get to do that here. And if that person who's kind of espousing these views says like, your incivility is not making it possible for us to talk, that's not really civility, right? That's pseudo civility. And so I wanna make a distinction here. Civility, honestly, is what allows us, it's kind of the, um, the ability to have kind of public discourse, right? It's allow, it's what allows us to engage for, for me to speak for you, to listen, all this kind of stuff. Um, it has been used as a tool though, and as a weapon to marginalize and silence uh, historically and today, lots of people, not individually, but entire kind of populations. And so I think being able to unpack and recognize its own kind of nuance of what we mean when we say that, which is why I include that slide, right? We can talk about it as following the rules, which have their place, but that's not it, right? It's also this deeper sense of responsibility to each other. And if we can do that, then that makes a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's interesting, just like breaking it all down. Uh, like you could just talk about it and I could listen to it for a really long time. Um, my next question is gonna be for Melissa. Um, Melissa, if, if people are not watching us live tonight, um, how long do they have before they can sign up? Like, do they need to run and do it right away when they're watching it on YouTube or Facebook? Um, or do they have some time to be part of this project? You're muted. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's never a Zoom program them. without a mute situation, so it's totally yeah, You're right. Um, no, uh, folks are welcome to, to sign up uh, at any given moment. Um, we're going to be uh, recording throughout the, throughout the summer. Um, and so we, at any given moment, they could sign up. I mean, there, there's no particular rush uh, to, to, to sign up immediately. And the webinar is happening every other month. So if you can't catch it this month, um, you could catch it in, in the following month. So. Thank you. And I think this one's probably going to be for you as well. And um, if someone does not know what side of the political spectrum they're on, is there like a category for that as well? 
if you are kind of identify, I guess maybe is in the middle, but maybe on both sides, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we welcome every, everyone to participate. Um, like Timothy has mentioned, there are so many nuances. We're not just like one thing, right? So there's so many things that go into our composition as people. Um, so um, it, it, everyone brings value to the table and to have these conversations. So uh, whoever is open and willing to have these conversations, we invite them to do so despite uh, their, their political leniency, whether it's right, left, middle, or somewhere in that space in between. Add to, to, to oh, that. Um, yes, just absolutely. As, um, when I did matching of participants, it wasn't always about where they are, left or right. Um, it was also, you know, there were the the uh, form you fill out to get signed up has more questions on it than just that. Um, and so people like um, Tracy and Scott, for example. Well, I didn't know this in the form, but they both happen to come from very large families, very large nuclear families. And if uh, a couple of individuals have like a something in common as well as things that are different, that can make a really good pairing. So just providing as much information as you can put into that form can um, help you to get like the best conversation partner possible. That's interesting and and now it makes me want to like dive into your whole experience as a as a facilitator for these um conversations because i bet that was a whole other kind of experience and an insight into um all these outcomes that can happen i um but we are hitting our 7 30 mark and i don't want to hold on I, i'm nothing if i'm not punctual um and so I definitely want to call attention to the fact that I've put an evaluation in, for tonight's program in the chat box. Um, Dr. Schaefer has also included a resource for political ideology, if you're interested in that. Um, you can find those in the chat box. I want to take a moment to officially thank our speakers tonight while everybody's still on, though we can continue this q and I have no problem doing that. I just want to officially end the program. So um, let me just get my thank yous out of the way. So I want to thank Sarah Jane Crespo, um, Haley Croson, and Luann Stevens, and all the other folks from KMEW for their help in putting together this program, the productions, and all of that, um, as well as your work on One Small Step. I think it's obvious that you're making um, little steps towards the progress, and um, that's going to have a huge impact. Thank you to Dr. Schaefer for his insight on this very important topic tonight. Um, fascinating stuff. Thank you to Scott and Tracy for sharing their conversation with the world. Thanks to uh, Melissa Velasquez and the folks at One Small Step for pioneering this project. And so with that, we will officially end tonight's program.